Not the first time, and almost certainly, Sadiq Khan, not the last time we'll be talking about a terror attack upon the streets of our city. The, the difference is, of course, that, that you have some responsibility for running it and the rest of us don't. What, what happened? Well, I, I'm actually angry about uh, the incident yesterday, but also when you add it to the incident in November, what worries me makes me angry is we've got an example of somebody who has been convicted of terrorist-related offensive. Uh, somebody who uh, the police had arrested, uh, he'd been charged and prosecuted. Uh, and this was clearly uh, an incident that was both uh, preventable and uh, predictable. And uh, but for uh, the, the, the knife injuries being one inch on either side, but for the brilliance and speed of the police, but for the excellence of the medic staff, we could be having a conversation today about a number of people having lost their lives as a consequence of a terrorist attack that need not have occurred. Um, some listeners may not be aware that before going into politics you, you were a lawyer, so you're probably better placed than many politicians to answer my next question, which is, could he have been... Could, the bit that a lot of us don't understand is if he was sufficiently suspicious to have been tailed by MI5 watchers, how was he not sufficiently suspicious to have been left in jail? And, and were, the, were the, the hands of the authorities tied by the legalities of the situation or not? <laughs> Uh, you've got to go back to a package of changes made by the government over the last 10 years. So the first thing is this, James. You need to make sure judges have the tools to give the right sentence for somebody found guilty of a serious offence. And because the government wanted to save money and reduce the prison population, they removed an offence the judges had called an indeterminate sentence to protect the public. And when was that? that what year was that? That was, in, that was in 2012 right. when David Cameron was the Prime Minister. So that means judges have less tools to give the right sentence. The second part of the equation... And, and uh, forgive me, you're, p you're politicking slightly when you say they did it to reduce the prison population. Oh, that is the reason why. No, no, that's, but if that's I asked David Cameron why he'd done it, would he say that? Uh, he would because oh, he reduced, well, he, okay. cut, he cut the MOJ budget by a huge amount uh, and, and they thought that actually because there were lots of people in prison, thousands on an IPP, they were taken at places that should be given to others and they did want to reduce the prison estate. The second part of the story is once people are in prison, the two important things that must happen is punishment and reform. But because of the massive cuts on our prisons, fewer prison officers, when people are in prison, not only are they not being punished or reformed, but they've been further radicalised. There was a report done in by the Her Majesty's Inspectorate but also a report in 2016, which said that actually prisons were, I'm paraphrasing, universities of crime. So somebody's convicted of a terrorist offence, they're sent to prison, they are further radicalised rather than being punished or reformed. And here's a third part of the equation, which is the probation service, which is supposed to supervise bad people, I'm paraphrasing, uh, has been privatised uh, and lost some of the expertise. And so a combination of those three things, plus there is very little discretion to keep somebody in who is still a danger because of changes made. So it's a toxic mix, which is why I'm so angry, because in November, uh, Boris Johnson and the Home Secretary promised they would learn the right lessons and bring about changes. And we've got now a second case in three months. Do you know what day he was released on? January the 23rd. Uh, and the, the, the important point is here, the authorities, not just the police, but probation and the prison authorities and, and the whole team of people who look after people, uh, clearly must have thought he was a danger, which is why even though he was released, he was put under supervision. And I make this point, he wasn't just put under close supervision, he was put under supervision by a team who were armed. And so that in itself tells all of us, you don't have to be an ex-lawyer to know this, there was clearly a concern yeah. about him. And the point I'm making is, it's all well and good, the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary talking about tough measures and longer sentences, but the whole package of measures we've seen over the last 10 years have led to a situation where you've got a convicted terrorist within a week of being released, being, being followed by armed officers, but still causing the, uh, the, the damage he caused yesterday. And, and I mean, you know, that this is a government which has somehow, for good or for ill, managed to disassociate itself from the last 10 years of, of Conservative government. Um, it, you're, you're, you're on a hiding to nothing, aren't you, if you're trying to sort of pin this retrospectively on the Conservative well, Cuts programme? Can, can I just say, I was a Member of Parliament for many years, and between 2010 and 2016, when I stopped being an MP, I would regularly be in... Uh, a lobby voting against these changes uh, and in the other lobby were conservative parliamentarians which who include by the way 
Boris Johnson and uh, Priti Patel. So look, I, I'm not. This is not. This is not just me saying. Listen, this government's responsible. It's me saying, let's work together, a Conservative government and a Labour mayor, to make our city safe. One of the things we can do is give judges the tools they need to give the right sentence. Another thing we can do is reverse the cuts in the prison service. Make sure that people who go to prison are both punished and reformed, which means being de-radicalised, which means being re Which means spending money. Which means spending money. And by okay, the way... just to we, clarify, we, but it, it, if, if I had been working in that prison as a guard or indeed as a, a, on the rehabilitation side of things and I had genuinely believed that this man was still... A, a serious risk to the public. There would be nothing that anybody could have done to keep him in jail. There are very few tools in the, at the disposal of the parole board and, and the governor. What would have happened is this, though, James. Because of the uh, fact that prison officers are fewer now and they're not skilled up and haven't got the confidence, they may not have spotted this guy was uh, uh, not has not been de-radicalised and had become, in fact, radicalised. In this case, we know they were aware. But here's the other problem. There's a report done in 2016 by uh, Mr Ian Aitchison, and he talked about how, in our prisons, Officers and governors haven't got the confidence to take on uh, people like this man. But also, we had a case last month in uh, Whitemore Prison where two uh, prisoners had been radicalised and uh, almost were successful in killing a prison officer. So the idea uh, that people who go to prison are, are punished and reformed isn't happening. They're being radicalised more so. And so, yeah... The, the, there are limited tools at the disposal of the parole board of the prison to keep somebody in uh, and that's because of government changes over the last uh, 10 years but secondly we need to make sure in prisons rather than being simply warehouses to store people they're places to both punish and reform um 30 minutes it took the ambulance to get to the first stab victim is, is that par for the course in london now well, well, well firstly uh, james we've got to make sure we give accurate information that's not true the ambulance were there within four minutes i think or three minutes what happened was you've got what's called a hot zone that means that, uh, for very good reasons, uh, uh, although uh, emergency responders often risk their own lives to keep us safe, they're advised by the police to stay outside the hot zone, but they were there literally uh, helping those who had been injured. And I'll tell you this again, but for the response of uh, not just the police, but the LAS and the, the ambulance service and the medics, I suspect we could have seen two people very seriously injured, uh, be a fatality, but for their work. Um, just to park the partisan of politics, if the Home Secretary makes a speech later today or tomorrow about substantive changes she intends to make to the system, what would you applaud most enthusiastically? Uh, what I'd applaud is giving judges the tools they need, in addition to giving prisons the support they need to rehabilitate and uh, punish, but also to look at the whole way we deal with uh, people who are convicted. Let me give you one amazing step, which is, forget terrorism for a second, half of those, half of those who leave our prisons will re-offend within a year, half. Now, adding to that convicted terrorist, why are we surprised that somebody convicted of a terrorist offence who is released from prison is re-offended? It's because prisons aren't working. And so, look, I'm looking forward to working with the government. Well, what what, what about the idea that, that radicalised uh, extremists can't be rehabilitated in the way that um, other criminals can? Some can, and I've met people who have been de-radicalised, both extreme far-right well, so and I, also so-called Islamist. Yes. Uh, you, you can do, but, you know, it, it, it takes hard work. It takes skilled staff. It takes the word that you've just used before, resources and investment. And actually, I'd make, we, we published a, a report last week in relation to violent crime, which talked about the economic cost of violent crime. So there's actually an economic case in invested in prevention, because I'm telling you this, the uh, terrorist attack yesterday is costing us millions and millions of pounds. As I speak to you now, there's a cordon around that uh, incident in Streatham. There are a couple of dozen police officers because there's a forensics team working there. And just imagine the cost of the last 24 hours. Just imagine mm. the cost of not just a surveillance team following this guy around, but there are an armed surveillance team with an intelligence cell nearby. So there's actually an economic argument for the government investing in uh, the resources in prison. Uh, in, in changing the, 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 what they brought in in probation, but also in giving our police the support they need in terms of additional police officers, including a counter-terror team as well. Mary Landers, Sadiq Khan, many thanks for your time.